Thanks so much. It's really wonderful to be here virtually and to share a little bit about the future of health and medicine. Where can technology take us? It's incredible that it's been five, no, actually make that 25 years since I graduated from here at Stanford Medical School. It was an amazing six years, because of course I took the full six year uh, opportunity. Uh, and I'm still great friends with many of the folks I uh, went to med school with, like Dr. Lee Sanders, who's now chair of general pediatrics here at Stanford. Uh, we still go biking together. Friends like Esteban Bouchard, now a full professor at UCSF. It was amazing to have a community that I've stayed connected with over the years, from classmates like Sherry Fink, who I could visit at the New York Times, where she's now won two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, to um, folks that we uh, uh, launched the first sweat trips for incoming medical students. So really grateful for the, the friends, the community, the, the fellow students uh, that have been part of my Stanford experience, both as a medical student and then later coming back for fellowships in pediatric hematology, oncology, and bone marrow transplantation, where I was lucky to be a postdoc in the lab of Dr. Irv Weissman, both as a medical student, as a Howard Hughes fellow, and, and later as a, a fellow, and even to me mentor undergrads and med students like Dr. Anishka Chekowitz, who's gone on to be a professor here as well. So um, uh, an amazing community of researchers and, and beyond. And, and what I thought was particularly uh, unique for me around my med school experiences was I took full advantage of everything from med scholars, where I even did uh, medical expeditions to Nepal, to doing a Howard Hughes fellowship, to maintaining my flying and doing uh, the flying doctors, to, uh, uh, to working uh, with Stanford engineers on missions to Mars and doing research at NASA Ames. So tremendous opportunities to cross-fertilize on this incredible campus. So I'm really grateful for that, and hopefully my uh, son Leo, who's now six, uh, who has played with the Stanford band as well, uh, uh, has an interest in science. We'll see where that goes. So we're here today to talk a bit about where health and medicine is going, a bit with the lens of technology. Of course, technologies are accelerating all around us and have really reshaped our world and disrupted entire fields. You know, how we do our banking, how we get our movies have all now sort of entered that fourth industrial age, often at the blend of, of AI and blockchain and you know, uber personalization. Uh, and of course, our entire world uh, has been disrupted medically and otherwise by the horrible COVID pandemic. Um, and, but the pandemic does give us a bit of a lens to think about how do we really shift healthcare from what's really been stuck in sort of the third industrial age to really move forward into the promise of the fourth industrial age and, and beyond. And, you know, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is it's really forced some change. I love this cartoon. Who changed or who led the digital transformation of your company or, or healthcare? The CEO, the CTO, or COVID-19? In a sense, you know, just like Sputnik uh, set off the space age, COVID is sort of really sparking a bit of a health age. And we all have an opportunity to now rethink and reimagine healthcare across the care continuum. And we all know some of the examples are around us from the, the first sequencing in January of last year to the first batch of vaccine a month later to clinical trials being completed on, on market uh, less than uh, 11 months later. In fact, Moderna was founded by a postdoc I was with in the Weissman lab. And so incredible opportunities with mRNA and beyond. And uh, part of the challenge, of course, with all these new opportunities is how do we bring them to market? How do we show they're efficacious? We obviously don't just have a, a, a pandemic, we have an infodemic and how we communicate and the fact the efficacy of a vaccine as we saw here out of Southwestern Medical Center uh, is really important as we, as we communicate and imagine the future of healthcare. So speaking about the future, you know, we're here at Stanford, at least virtually right now, with, we have a brand new hospital. So when we think about the future of the hospital, you know, or the future of health in general, what does that really look like? Uh, a few years ago, I was lucky, uh, two years ago, lucky to share a whole session uh, on the future of the hospital with hospital CEOs from around the country, in including the Stanford CEO, Dr. Uh, David Entwistle. And part of our takeaway was that the future of the hospital was really no longer going to be the hospital. We're increasingly going into virtualized care from hospital to home or hospital to homespital. And that virtualization has certainly been accelerated in the time of pandemic, or we've gone to lab to laptop. And so we're starting to blend modalities. And when you're thinking about the today and the future, we need to think about where the puck is going and how, those, how do those elements blend. But before we sort of look into the future, it's sometimes helpful to have a look back to the future. Uh, I went back for my uh, reunion of my uh, classmates uh, at Mass General Hospital, where I did residency after Stanford in both internal medicine and pediatrics. And what was sort of surprising being back on the ward where I was an intern 20-something years ago was really not that much had changed. You know, same alarms were beeping, some of the same nurses, maybe some of the same patients. The only difference is now the poor intern on call was now pushing around a laptop and typing the medical record. We used to handwrite it. And of course, they're still using the cutting edge medical communication tool of our day, you know, the fax machine. <laughs> uh, we're still using paper forms. Uh, I recently had a cardiac study done in a local clinic and the only way I could get my results back were on a CD-ROM. I don't even own a CD-ROM player anymore. So we're still in this age of 
being tied to the past but wanting to break that open into the future. We're still using, you know, public health measures that are over 100 years old. So I would challenge you all to think, how do we take some of the new potentials I'm going to speak about and get out of the old silos, whether it's how we set up our waiting rooms, whether it's in Palo Alto, San Francisco, or Calcutta, or how do we even redesign, redesign medical education and uh, hospital departments out of the buckets, which are often designed around body parts, when we're today, we're in this molecular, genetic, uh, uber-connected uh, uh, age. So lots of challenges and lots of opportunities. Part of that is changing our, our mindset. You know, what do we practice today? It's really more sick care than health care. What do I mean by, by sick care? Sick care is based on our pretty much current model. We get very intermittent and episodic data. Think about it. Your patients usually only see you in the four walls of their uh, annual visit or, God forbid, in the ER, intensive care unit. That's where we collect the data. And that intermittent episodic data, even when it is, my, is collected from home, it's challenging to get it to you as a provider, you know, through fax or PDF of, of their bl blood sugars or blood pressures. So our intermittent and episodic data leads to our reactive model. We tend to wait for patients to show up in the, in the ER with, uh, with heart uh, a heart attack or a stroke or in my world of oncology with late stage tumors. And part of the potential as we move forward is to move from intermittent and reactive to an era which is much more continuous with our data, that's much more personalized data, that can enable us to be more proactive as individuals, as clinicians, uh, and to start to really democratize that connected mobile care anytime, anywhere with lower costs and better outcomes. And to truly move to an era, we often talk about precision medicine, from imprecision medicine to precision. Because even today, the top 10 grossing drugs are only really, really impactful and helpful for about one in four to one in 24 of the patients we prescribe them to. So lots of room for improvement and to move the needle, not just in you know, preventing disease or treating it in better ways, but to think about precision wellness and not just optimizing the, the lifespan of our patients, but the health span going forward. So what I'd like to talk about is how do we achieve some of those aims? How do we really build that future of medicine? I was lucky to write the opening article for National Geographic a year or so ago with a whole issue around the future of medicine. And they retitled my, my article, 12 Innovations That Will Revolutionize the Future of Medicine. And in fact, it's not about any one innovation, but how those technologies are coming together. And many of those technologies are really rapidly accelerating. They often are quote unquote exponential. Uh, technologies that double in their speed uh, or lower in their price every one to two years. Um, but it's hard for our brains to sort of grasp exponentials. You know, we all pass math. You know, we know counting to 30 will give you 30 meters, but 30 exponential steps uh, actually gets you to a billion. And that would be 26 times around the planet if I was doubling each step as we go. And we've seen, of course, exponentials embedded in Moore's Law, you know, the power of computing getting faster and cheaper. You know, I still have my uh, antique iPhone uh, 2. It's like 10, 11 years ago. It was amazing 10 years ago, but now it feels slow and clunky and has a low resolution camera. You know, we've seen incredible progression in terms of how much processing power we can have. And now in the supercomputers in our pocket, I found, I found in, my, in my drawer just before this talk, my original uh, era 1990, I think I was the first on campus to have a little pocket computer from Sharp. Then I had the Trio, you know, and then, of course, when I was a medical student, we didn't have internet. We didn't have smartphones. We now have this amazing new connected age. And so it used to be in the era of the uh, 1990s when I was a medical student, you know, thousands of dollars of technology, those have been appified and digitized and uh, will soon dissolve into our augmented reality uh, lenses from, from Apple or, or others. So when you think about this exponential, it means many older, more expensive technologies, including those in healthcare, can become uh, digitized, dematerialized, uh, then de demonetized and, and democratized, sometimes in conflict with the misaligned incentives in healthcare. And it reminded me, again, as I mentioned, that we didn't have, you know, internet, Google, uh, DVDs even when I was a first-year medical student. We didn't have mobile phones, no social media, no PowerPoint. As exemplified by a classmate there in 1991, we still had our, our uh, images on slides. Lots of old analog systems are being digitized. Sometimes it's not the mission to digitize the analog, but to reinvent it entirely. So let's talk now about how we can reimagine healthcare along the continuum, what's possible today and what might be possible in the next five, 10 years. Because while the last 10 years were pretty incredible, the next 10 years, I would argue, will make the, next, the last 10 years look slow and catalyzed by COVID. So part of the catalyzation and changing, of course, is increasing empowered consumer. The empowered consumer can now use their smartphone and 
check uh, Stanford versus UCSF, or one doctor versus another, or go to GoodRx and check drug prices, or now there are platforms where you can literally look at surgical scorecards and look at individual surgeons and their outcomes for particular procedures. So now with our mobile technology, we can empower each of us to have better insight and data, and that can push us as clinicians and healthcare systems to improve. And of course, a lot of that is riding on our magical smartphones, which are really becoming medicalized, right? These are becoming platforms, not just for communication, but increasingly diagnostic platforms. And uh, for example, you know, you can now look in your child's ear and pretty much diagnose an ear infection. Will that be misaligned with the payment models for the pediatrician? Possibly. Uh, and now Apple and Samsung and others are building all sorts of other technologies into our mobile devices. So on this exponential, what used to fit on our desktop in 2000, you know, now fits on your Apple Watch, which is of course becoming a FDA cleared device, can maybe do a screening diagnosis for atrial fibrillation and soon might pick up uh, real-time blood pressure and blood sugar. So lots of potential coming in this mobile age. And the challenge it is, is to integrate these new technologies across the healthcare continuum, from prevention to diagnostics to therapy to how we do clinical trials and to globalizing and democratizing healthcare. So let's go through some of those pretty quickly. Part of that new connection is, of course, leveraging our new Internet of Things, Internet of Medical Things, now riding 5G, right? We now create immense amount of data from our wearable devices, from our full genomes that can be done for less than $1,000, to our imaging and beyond, to telemedicine data. And the challenge is all these massive amounts of data can provide insights, but they're often siloed. Dots are not connected. Interoperability is a challenge. Until a few years ago, to get an imaging study from UCSF down to Stanford, you had to drive it down in any CD-ROM. So we need to close that gap between creating new amounts of data, narrowing that to becoming insights and actual information, and then of course that gap between new knowledge to something that comes to us in the clinic at the point of care or for a patient or a caregiver anywhere around the world through their mobile and connected devices. So we need to narrow that gap, and that is something that's been narrowed in the setting of COVID. Something that also is expanded in the era of COVID is the infodemic. How do we communicate with our patients about uh, therapy, testing, PPE, lots of challenges embedded there as well. And of course, it means we understand that it's not just about the technology, but understanding the incentives, right? It's not just enough to have a, a next generation imaging device, but how do we pay for it? How do we incentivize the left side of this equation, you know, health and prevention, rather than the right side of the curve, which is traditionally where fee-for-service uh, care has taken us? Now, with the new incentives for outcome-based medicine, where outcomes are the new uh, incomes, we're seeing the shift to virtualizing care from the hospital to the home, to our phone, to even inside our bodies. Uh, we're seeing the, the corner pharmacies uh, start to battle it out as places where folks are gonna get diagnostics and, and primary care. Of course, that's coming to the virtual world. We'll talk more about that later. So we're gonna be in competition potentially with the Walmart Health or in partnership with them as we go forward. Part of that new partnership and cooperation, of course, is riding this, these digital rails. We're in this era of you know, connected care, mobile care, digital care. I think those are all buzzwords. We'll just soon call it you know, care or healthcare. But it does give us the opportunity to connect the dots and to integrate the data and the sources and match those to the individual or the clinical practice or the healthcare system or the hospital in this sort of new digital age. And now at Stanford and other centers, we're studying digital health to see that you know, not just giving someone a Fitbit is gonna mean they're gonna lose weight, but how do you integrate those in smart ways into the care pathways, into uh, the workflow of the clinician uh, to be meaningful and actually valuable. Now, digital is just one component. We have now the integration of AI, robotics, 3D printing, nanotech, blockchain, synthetic biology, the super convergence of things getting faster, cheaper, and better that's giving us the opportunity now to create entire new fields. I think when most, most of us were medical students, we didn't have you know, robotic surgery or digiceuticals or AI-driven drug discovery. There's this amazing new interface that allows us to address the new challenges that we have in healthcare across the planet. In fact, uh, during the COVID times, I've been chairing the XPRIZE Pandemic Alliance Task Force. Part of our goal is to integrate solutions from multiple players. Instead of having a thousand flowers bloom, let's pick the right ones, let's collaborate and move those to solutions faster for this pandemic and to prevent future ones. And we realize that, of course, while technology plays a role in addressing solutions, particularly as amplified under the pandemic, is that our social determinants are often more critical, our zip code being more important than our genetic code, and understanding and appreciating social determinants and understanding how we can improve upon those uh, for both uh, primary care uh, to almost every element of healthcare around the planet. So let's start with the core physiologic needs, you know, vaccines, clean water, uh, good education. And of course, Maslow's hierarchy is now expanded to, of course, not just Wi-Fi, but the battery life. So the digital determinants of health, do your patients have access to Wi-Fi for or a mobile phone or connectivity, whether it's for managing their diabetes or educating their kids at home during a lockdown? 
And of course, with new technologies, we are starting to democratize and bring high-speed internet access anywhere. So reimagination, what do we do with all this new potential, right? We all can think about Uber as an example. They're an exponential company. They didn't invent the smartphone, GPS, online payments. They connected the dots to reimagine and disrupt how we get around when we used to drive, right? Uh, we've seen the urbanization of many sorts of fields, right? From doctor calls to having your drugs delivered by pharmacy. Uh, Amazon, of course, getting into healthcare is creating a big splash. In fact, they've now created an Amazon pharmacy. That's disruptive to many players. So with new players coming in, leveraging these new connected technologies, things can happen faster than you might anticipate. I used to joke about you know, drones delivering your drugs uh, or Amazon uh, uh, Prime Care, but that's actually coming to reality. And now drones are delivering test kits, labs, and even medications in certain parts of the United States. So it changes upon us, right? It's disruptive, you know, Pharmageddon, no longer the one size blockbuster drug. It's disruptive to uh, the health insurance and the payment models. How do we make that more engaging? It's uh, disruptive to all sorts of players that were the top 50 when I was in here in med school. We don't use Kodak anymore or, or blockbuster, or in some cases even Skype. And we can learn lessons from companies like Kodak that invented digital photography, but didn't want to pay attention or leverage it uh, moving forward because it was in conflict with their film sales. And what happened? They went bankrupt in, 12, 12, in 2012, 2013, and 12 kids down the street from here in Palo Alto sold Instagram for a billion dollars. So you don't want to be the next uh, blockbuster. You want to be Ubering yourself before you get kodak And that applies in healthcare as well. So I've had an interesting role after doing, you know, uh, med peds, hematology, oncology, uh, and beyond uh, in a role chairing medicine at something called Singularity University, uh, based at NASA Ames down the road from here. And part of the mission of Singularity University is to understand all these technologies, and with my academic hat on, how do we apply that to reimagining healthcare? And from that, I built out a program called Exponential Medicine, looking at all these exponentials and how do we leverage them to reshape and reimagine all sorts of elements of healthcare. And the bottom line element is that we need to converge fields, payers, patients, uh, investors, technologists, to mix it up more uh, as we start to address solutions going forward and also to change our, our headspace. This is a quote from, uh, shared by Tony Young, the head of NHS Innovation. The difficulty lies often not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. So what old ideas might be holding you or your colleagues or your administrators back as we try and reshape healthcare? How do we help the regulators, right? Like the FDA, which has now moved forward to accelerate how they do regulatory, software as a medical device, and new pathways to accelerating the sort of convergence of technologies that are not just drugs and not just devices as we move forward into an accelerating age of, of drugs or digital layers that move around them. So you might want to check out exponentialmedicine.com. Uh, lots of great talks there from thought leaders from Stanford and around the world who are really helping uh, shape healthcare going forward. Let's now look at four areas, how they might apply to you and your practice, and as we shift healthcare going forward. Let's start with health and prevention, right? We know that it's not our genes that drive most disease, it's our behaviors, particularly our behaviors over time. And now we're in a time where we can start to measure our behaviors. I did a project with uh, a Stanford professor and double E, Greg Kovacs, uh, 17 years ago, where we built one of the first black boxes for the body uh, to understand astronauts on the space station. Now, of course, we have these sort of technologies on our wrists. The Fitbit, for example, and I'm wearing a Fitbit right now and an Apple Watch and a Whoop, <laughs> are, are, you know, only been with us for, what, 11, 12 years? And now there are essentially wearables, I'm sure many of you have them and many of your patients, that can measure almost every element of physiology and behavior. Um, but it's not often connected to our care. What do we do about that? How do we leverage sometimes the simple data, sensors 1.0, all the way to the fancy sensors, an RFID and a pill to optimize adherence going forward? Or digital tattoos that can keep a patient monitored outside of the hospital setting. How can we take simple digital biomarkers like steps? Do you send a patient home after COVID admission or after total hip replacement? Are they walking more or are they walking less? If they're walking less, maybe something's going on and you can intervene early. Or in my field of oncology, we can tell how someone's doing post-chemo and what their survivability might be just from their wearable data. So it doesn't need to be fancy. And so my hope is that, you know, many of us are data geeks. We track our steps and our sleep. Many of your patients do, but it's often called quantified self. It's sort of stuck and silent on our phones. How do we convert that into quantified health that's going to flow to you, to uh, your whole healthcare system? How do we use that measure to optimize prevention, screening, wellness, to diagnose disease early. And then when we do treat something from as common as hypertension to depression to cancer, it's more data-driven with a feedback loop going forward. 
Let's look at some quick examples of things that have been digitized. Now, of course, our scales have been digitized, and you can go beyond checking your, your weight to even your shape. Here's a startup doing a, a shape scale. So you, whether you want it or not, you can have a screen of your patient's weight, but also their muscle mass and fat mass. That might be part of our future physical exam. We can now start to quantify and digitize our blood pressure. It can be embedded in the, in the, in the side of a, of, a, of a watch. Or increasingly, we're going to see blood pressure that is done non-invasively without wearing anything at all. We're moving from wearables to the idea of insidable sensors that can go in our contact lenses or in chips underneath our skin that can measure things like blood oxygenation uh, for a patient who might have a risk of an amputation or measure blood chemistries and transmit that, uh, let's say, from a chronic disease patient anywhere in the world. Or we're moving from wearables to the idea of a, a shockable that might help change your patient's behavior. Hearables, they might just be not just a hearing aid, but provide AI and guidance and other information. Ringables, some of you have seen the Aura Ring, a ring that shrinks all this exponential technology that can track, uh, for example, be a sleep lab on your finger. And if, if you do nothing else for yourself or your patients with a simple wearable, tracking sleep uh, has such an important uh, op opportunity to improve so many elements and health metrics going forward. So track your own sleep, and many of us in medical training and beyond don't get a great amount of it. That is something simple that these wearable devices are enabling going forward and understand, letting us understand the tie between sleep and many chronic and other diseases. What else can you start to quantify that might be surprising? Well, you might be going out on a, on, a, on a social engagement, a date, when we get back to in-person visits. You might want to check your breath with the breathable, the quality of your breath. But now, the molecules in your breath are being measured by essentially nano noses that can start to pick up signs of early, let's say, lung cancer or even COVID. We're seeing sensors come into our clothing. Sockables, for example, for a diabetic patient uh, at risk for neuropathy can measure hot spots before they might find them and prevent uh, an ulcer or ultimately an amputation. Um, an underwearable. These devices are getting so cheap that you don't need to wear anything. You just put one in 10 pairs of underwear, uh, and I'm wearing some right now. I won't show you. But now uh, I can track my respiratory rate, my steps, uh, uh, and oxygen saturation. And what's interesting, these started as consumer devices uh, to measure stress and mindfulness. But now with new remote patient monitoring codes and CPT reimbursements, these types of technologies are being used for remote patient monitoring to track a patient who has pneumonia or COVID at home in an integrated, connected way and aligning the incentives. Or there might be a shakeable to help track the tremor in a patient and, and, and optimize uh, their dopaminergic drugs. Or for a patient at risk for a fall, they might wear a, a connected welt, that tra a belt called the welt that tracks their gait and their risk for a fall. And maybe the next versions uh, will embed, may not be so sexy, but uh, an airbag in your belt if, if it's needed to, to prevent uh, a hip a fracture in those at high risk. So wearables can go in all sorts of ways. We're now seeing wearable exoskeletons that can enable someone who's paraplegic to walk. Or the extremes of wearables, my favorite since I'm a pilot, uh, is a jet suit, you know, now being piloted to see if they can be used to help rescue folks in emergency medical situations and in remote uh, mountains in Switzerland. Uh, I got a chance to actually fly this myself. It's a little harder than it looks. Um, but, you know, wearables are coming uh, well beyond uh, the wrist. And then other things we can quantify. Of course, Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. Now we have a new era where we can start to quantify our food. You might measure it for gluten or for peanut allergies. We're starting to see ways where we can determine uh, input, and including blood sugar in real time. We can measure output. You know, We measure it in the inpatient setting. Why not do that at home? Several startups are building measures for that in the home setting. You can now uh, enter the age of metabolomics. Uh, some of us have worn you know, continuous glucose monitors, whether you're diabetic or not, understanding how you respond to different diets. So I think we're going to really start to enter an era of precision nutrition. Uh, rumor has it some of the next generation wearables will measure blood sugar non-invasively. And that will be a game changer as we start to integrate all these new data sets to go beyond the fad diet and really optimize our, our, our nutrition based on our microbiome, our genome, our metabolome, and beyond. Huge impact there. Now, beyond wearing devices with batteries, we're just having whole other ways of measuring things now. The idea of in, invisibles or ambient sensing. The camera now on your smartphone uh, can be used to detect and measure heart rate, blood pressure, O2 sat, heart rate variability, soon maybe uh, blood, sh uh, blood sugar and blood pressure. So that can be collected while you're on a Zoom call from your patients. Or new ways to um, enable aging in place. Is the couple upright? Are they drinking? Are they safe? Uh, definitely some privacy concerns, but new ways to measure elements. 
voice as a biomarker can pick early signs of neurologic diseases like Parkinson's. Or voice as a biomarker from your cough can determine is it COVID, uh, croup, or uh, a simple cold. So lots of new ways to measure things beyond wearables. Even our smart speakers have been modified now to detect vital signs of multiple people in the same room. So Alexa might not just speak to you, but be measuring your vital signs. Or your Wi-Fi, as has been modified by MIT engineers, can pick up the vital signs of, of up to 10 people in the same room and their vitals and their sleep patterns and their behavior elements. So lots of new ways to gain insights into continuity of care. The challenge is, of course, that means for each of us and our patients, their digital exhaust, their digitome is sort of being collected 24-7. What are the implications of that? Who owns that data? Is it the consumer companies? Is it the patient? Is it you as their clinician? Uh, how, wh how are we leveraging that data? You know, Big Brother and sometimes life insurance companies are having lower premiums for those who walk 10,000 steps a day. This is a cartoon from my exponential medicine conference. You know, what is it, Doc? Just as I thought, you're generating too much data. Most of us as clinicians are already overwhelmed. We don't want more data. We want more insights. The workflow is already hard enough with some of our epic fail uh, medical systems. So we need to think about integrating this new knowledge, new systems into the workflow of the clinician, that quadruple aim to redesign healthcare to enable and prevent burnout and beyond. OK, so we can collect this data. It might come to you in your EMR. But it's a bit of a so what, unless it's digestible, actionable, reimbursable, and is aligned with the incentives of the healthcare systems, which of course are very different depending on where you might be. It's starting to come together, however, right? With Apple HealthKit, with Common Health on Android, you can now integrate some of these sort of wearable and other data and sync it back. My data now goes to my, through Epic, to my primary care doctor at Stanford. Does he know what to do with my Fitbit data? Does he understand what it means in context? Well, that's coming now as well, because companies like Barely or the Google Health Spinout are new doing a project called Baseline, where 10,000 volunteers are sharing their digital exhaust, their genomes, their medical records. So we understand some of these new digital signals in context. Or the NIH All of Us trial, which I've signed up for, a million patients are framing him on steroids to collect data, not just from a small subset of nurses in Western Massachusetts in Framingham, but to make that meet different racial and socioeconomic groups. We're going to gain incredible insights from that. I call it sort of data plus algorithms, predictalytics. How is your patient doing? Not just their labs and their vitals and their genes, but their sexual health, their social connections, uh, and beyond. And hopefully leveraging that together will give us simplified data, just like with our modern cars, which have hundreds of sensors. What you really care about is when you or your patient's check engine light goes on. So imagine this integrated future where the data comes from now, very cheap, ubiquitous sensors, can give us that early insight before the patient blows a gasket or has a medical issue. And that's actually starting to come together. Some of the work at Stanford uh, by Chair of Genetics, Mike, Michael Snyder and, uh, uh, and others are sort of really starting to do that. Can you use your wearable as a check engine light for viral illness, studies from UCSD, Studies from Stanford recently that's showing, yes, the complex data that can be collected from our, our wearables can predict who's going to get COVID or who has COVID even when they're asymptomatic before they have symptoms. So lots of new tools at our disposal. Okay, we now have this new data. We have this new insights. We know that we should have our patients and ourselves you know, exercise more and eat less, but we know behavior change is hard, right? You can prescribe a drug, it may not be taken, or a diet. So we're seeing new tools integrate for behavior change, digital coaching, human avatars or human patients on the, on the other end of the line, Pop, platforms like the Vongo to help manage diabetes, now multi-chronic diseases, are really becoming effective and used and uh, being reimbursed. And some of these coaches, they can be a human, they can be a chatbot, or in some cases, they'll look real and really match the personality and the needs of the individual patient. So this is really starting to engage the individual. The new drug is the empowered, engaged patient who owns their data, understands it, works in partnership with their clinician going forward. But of course, those interactions aren't one size fits all. We need design thinking because if you're de dealing with a baby boomer or millennial, they may have the exact same pathophysiology, but they want to communicate with you differently. The millennial wants to Snapchat. Uh, the baby boomer still wants the hand on the shoulder. So we need to design these solutions to match the individual, the right age, culture, language going forward. Some of us want to go to fancy digital enabled clinics like Forward. Others might need a simpler ones. So it's not one size fits all, just like our medications. We can also start to communicate and coach with more easy to use platforms like voice, right? Amazon Alexa, help, I fall and I can't get up. Or Google Home, refill my medication. Or uh, send a message to my clinician or nurse practitioner. Many new ways to integrate that and integrate that into coaching. So imagine 
When your patients look in the mirror in the morning, they might see a personalized score integrating their information in a way that matches them. It might not just show them you of today or them of today, but you of tomorrow. If you're smoking, you can show your patient the impact of 10 years of two packs a day of smoking or what happens if they spend too much time on, on social media. And that's an example of this convergence of technology, not just for education and changing mindsets, but uh, across healthcare. That's augmented reality, virtual reality, and extended reality. Uh, 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 we have amazing new tools coming forward, like the, uh, like the Microsoft HoloLens. It's going to enable an upskill surgeons and clinicians of all types, whether it's doing neurosurgery or guiding an orthopedic surgeon step by step through a procedure. These are basically here today, and they're going to be really part of our future of care. It means we can bring augmented reality into the clinician space, you know, working a medical student or a fellow or CME, you know, with a practice patient, in this case, managing uh, pulmonary failure in the setting of, of coronavirus. It's going to mean we can use augmented reality to educate our patients. When they can see their asymptomatic disease in their own body, they're going to be much more likely to be actionable. And here's some fun examples of an augmented reality t-shirt to educate even children. You know, get them while they're young to understand their, their basic, uh, basic physiology. Here's my son Leo wearing his shirt. Uh, he now understands his basic physiology. Hopefully that'll make him healthier for the rest of his, of his life. Of course, there's virtual reality. It's uh, now something you can buy for two, three hundred dollars. Used to be a thousand dollars. It's fun to put grandma on a roller coaster. But the real applications here are in healthcare, including for therapy. VR can be used for pain management. Put someone in a cold environment. This is technology that was piloted at Stanford called Snow Snow World. They use less than half the amount of opiates in, in chronic burn patients. Or VR blended with medication for mental health, or for physical therapy to gamify it and make it more exciting and integrated and uh, actually done. Or I spent 100 days during the lockdown doing virtual reality workouts in an application called uh, Supernatural. You wake up in the morning or wherever time of the day, you go to the top of a mountain, you have a coach, you get, I get my heart rate to 160. I did that for 100 days straight, and my resting heart rate went down by uh, at least 10 points. So these things can work uh, in many realms. One of the biggest implications for VR and XR is in medical education. It's already being done here at Stanford. For example, VR to train fellows and medical students and even patients themselves about their cardiac anatomy. I, I can never remember what tetralogy of Fallot is, but if you can walk inside a heart and maneuver it and see it and almost feel it, amazing new ways to improve understanding and speed education uh, and communication. Or for surgeons now to be live streaming and recording surgeries around the world for thousands of medical students who may not have access or can't see over the shoulder of the clinician. A lot of work here at Stanford in simulation has been pioneered. That's blending with uh, video games even to, to try out elements that are hard to practice, like taking out a nail from someone's bronchus. Uh, or essentially the idea of a, a flight simulator for training, right? You can now go into a virtual environment and train on procedures, uh, have complications come up, uh, train on devices, and, and learn much faster than our old C1, do one, teach one. So I think the future won't be C1, do one, teach one as we were trained, but C1, sim one, sim one, sim one, until you'll get it right. And that's increasingly going to be part of our care. And what that hopefully takes us is we're going to learn from all the clinicians around the world, not just the ones that you train with in your clinic or operating room. Imagine building a bit of a ways for surgeons. You know, just like we have driver assist, uh, we're going to start to blend into surgical assist as robotics and other elements augment our abilities in procedures and cognitively going forward. 10 years ago, 11 years ago, the first iPads, well, they transformed med school. You know, when I was here, we were still watching our, our talks on high-speed VHS tapes. Of course, iPads and others have now transformed how we communicate for our patients and for ourselves, uh, and it's only going to accelerate from here. Okay, let's look at two more fields, diagnostics and therapy, right? We now have the ability to sometimes pick up disease at stage zero, like uh, uh, we can now can find evidence of patients who might be getting Alzheimer's 10 or 20 years early based on brain scans, their genetics, brain uh, scanning technologies, and get insights about who we need to intervene with early. And with some of the new interventions coming for neurologic diseases, maybe we start to treat them at stage zero, just like we treat uh, cardiovascular disease in some cases with statins when folks are asymptomatic. The scanning technologies uh, to be proactive in diagnosis diseases earlier are coming up. You know, not everyone's going to get a full body MRI every year, but these scans are getting faster and cheaper and more ubiquitous. And now there are scanners, MRIs that are uh, 20 times less expensive and mobile. And potentially in 10 years, you'll go to your corner pharmacy and maybe get a, a full body MRI within minutes read by an AI radiologist. So what about something more basic? What can we all do to enhance our diagnostics today? virtually or face-to-face, -face, the idea of the digital doctor's bag. We have all sorts of new tools and technologies now that can give us a, a virtual COVID test kit, for example, for a patient with a pulse oximeter, or new ways to, to monitor all these technologies in the home or a mobile setting as we go. 
You can buy a Tidal Care kit at the Best Buy today and ship that to your patients and use that as part of your virtual visit. So it's not just a FaceTime visit. There's the Echo Stethoscope out of Berkeley that does a much better job than me at listening to heart sounds, also does an EKG, and can diagnose a heart murmur or allow you to share uh, that uh, with your attending or your medical student when you have an interesting exam. We're moving now to the world of AI-powered ultrasound devices like this butterfly device. Um, I've got one in my pocket. I could do mobile scans. It's enhanced with AI. The data can be shared uh, easy, as easy as social media. So new ways to democratize how and where we do diagnostics from rural California uh, to rural Africa. And of course, we're going beyond the laboratory, the central laboratory, to the point now where a laboratory can be integrated into your smartphone. You know, a simple attachment on your smartphone can go well beyond doing blood sugar. And we're going to see now the catalyzation of point-based laboratory exams. Some of them won't require a lab at all. Your smartphone uh, is becoming a laboratory-based platform. Um, I'm on the board of an Israeli company called Healthy IO. Instead of bringing your urine to the lab, you just dip it, take a picture with your smartphone, the data goes to your physician to the pharmacist, and the drug might be delivered for the UTI the same day by drone, or it could be used to screen for uh, chronic kidney disease. And speaking of testing, particularly in the age of COVID, we know that it often took days, uh, very expensive testing that's uh, helped exacerbate the pandemic. So uh, as part of the XPRIZE, I helped launch with Jeff Huber, the founder of Grail, a new XPRIZE for frequent, fast, cheap, and easy COVID testing. We had 700 teams from 70 countries compete for the $6 million XPRIZE. We just announced uh, the winners uh, in uh, March of this year. Some incredible new technologies that are gonna help democratize testing, not just for COVID and beyond. Another interesting example of a Stanford spinout um, uh, called Visby Medical, PCR in a box, disposable PCR in a box. Put your sample in, press one, two, three, three minutes later, you have the result back. And this is examples of the acceleration of technology and testing that will help many fields going forward. And once you have a diagnosis, uh, or you've been tested positive or negative, or you've been hopefully been vaccinated, we're starting to see the advent of a digital yellow card. So you can communicate that when you travel on an airplane or go to workplace uh, uh, or beyond. What other elements can we integrate into diagnostics? Of course, there's the full-on genome, right? The price of sequencing a genome has dropped at twice the rate of Moore's law. What do we do with that sort of information? It's still a challenge to use the low-hanging fruit of pharmacogenetics, but I think pharmacogenetics and other information will start to enter our clinical workflows and help us do better jobs of screening, diagnostics, and therapy, and understand diseases at the genetic level. You don't just have a patient with type 2 diabetes. You might have one with a very specific genetic subtype that we're going to manage differently based on exercise, diet, medications, and beyond. And finally, we're entering this sort of interesting age of, of polygenic risk scores, where we're going to understand our risks of a patient, even sequencing them before birth, and manage them differently. Not every woman needs their first mammogram at age 40 or an individual's colonoscopy at age 50. We're going to start to manage people differently based on better understandings of these polygenic risk scores, which, of course, need to be democratized across races, races and ethnic groups around the world. One of the last biomes I'll talk about is the microbiome, right? We're learning the incredible role of the microbiome in health and disease, whether it has a role in inflammatory bowel disease, neurologic disorders, how different microbiomes might impact the metabolism of certain drugs, um, all the way to even doing fecal matter, uh, fecal matter transplants uh, to cure diseases like C. diff and maybe reboot the uh, system of a patient with uh, uh, immunologic disorders and beyond. So. All right, we've talked about a lot. The challenge for all of us, it's overwhelming. How do we connect the dots, right? We used to have rules of thumb. Now there's thousands of used rules of thumb and thousands of data sets. It's overwhelming for you know, any clinician, let alone uh, uh, one who's leveraging all those sorts of information. At Stanford now, they've launched the, the Green Button campaign where you can start to do a uh, bioinformatics consult, taking some of this information about your patient, looking at other patients from Stanford and helping guide care. And of course, that's now being guided with artificial intelligence, AI. I like to refer to it more as IA, intelligence augmentation. We're going to start to use these tools to augment your ability to do a skin exam if you're a primary care physician. You don't need to do the consult in many cases. Uh, we're seeing uh, AI, of course, a lot of work at Stanford on, on augmenting radiology, sometimes doing a better job than uh, normal radiologists at screening and detecting uh, challenges. It's coming to digital pathology, which can do a better job than pathologists in many cases. And again, I don't think these are going to replace the clinician, but they're going to augment them. We're seeing AI help the colonoscopist uh, find a lesion that might, they might have missed um, otherwise. And where this comes together is that hopefully each of us and our patients will have a digital twin which will synthesize their multiomic data, their digital data, their socioome and beyond to give us insights and guidance to how to manage them proactively for prevention, diagnostics, and therapy. And of course, the human touch. That's not going to go away. 
Robots are not going to replace the clinician, uh, but the AI using, uh, the doctor using AI will replace those who don't, for better or worse. So it's a collaboration element, and it gives us the opportunity to upskill others, the nurse practitioner, the pharmacist, the tech, particularly in parts of the world which don't have en enough clinicians or specialists, can really be augmenting, augmented with these skills going forward. Let me finish up with therapy. Lots happening in therapy space. You know about CRISPR. Uh, all those are coming to the, to the world now with, you know, modifying bone marrow stem cells to, 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 to cure potentially thalassemia, uh, sickle cell disease. It enables us a lens to, to find pain points in our clinical journeys and improve them. As a BMT fellow here, I went for the Stanford Biodesign program in its first year. I had a pain point of harvesting bone marrow. You know, it takes uh, general anesthesia, 200 punctures, an hour in the operating room. I thought there's gotta be a better way. And since I was taking biodesign, I thought, what if we could build a rotor router for the bone marrow uh, harvesting? And I invented a device called the Marrow Miner and through the help of the Stanford community, got that through FDA into clinical trials, now FDA cleared. And we now have essentially a little minimally invasive rotor router device called the Marrow Miner, Marrow Miner that can enable us to harvest the entire bone marrow liter in 500 mils in essentially 20 minutes. So uh, lots of new ways when you have a, a challenge to help solve them in new collaborative forms. And Stanford Biodesign has been a great example of that. Drug delivery, compliance, adherence. We know that's a big challenge for our patients going forward. Lots of new tools there from apps uh, to uh, pumps to even now pills for a drug that used to be, or medication that used to be injected or needing infusion. This is in trials now. You swallow the little robotic pill. It injects the biologic, in this case an antibody drug, into the gut wall, uh, and you can avoid having the patient come in for an injection or an infusion. So lots of new forms of, of therapy in that role. Therapy can come to electricity, right? Beyond the pacemaker, uh, electroceuticals for treating sleep apnea, or a Stanford spin out that's using electricity as medicine for managing Parkinsonian tremors. Um, so we're seeing new advents and new forms of therapy. And then of course, we're now entering the virtual world. Uh, it's not gonna be the robot seeing you, but in some cases the robot will see you before it sees uh, the clinician. So virtual visits, of course, have exploded in the time of coronavirus. Uh, they're coming back down, but we've opened up the incentives and the regulatory paths. And now, in many cases, before you see the visit uh, on the screen with the clinician, you'll talk to the chatbot, which will do the screening, the basic 20 questions and help with triage. We're seeing digital mental health explode on the scene, many big opportunities there to address mental health challenges. So we're trying to start to prescribe an app, whether it's for mindfulness, for stress, a digiceutical to help with smoking cessation or diabetes. Uh, you might even prescribe a, a brain computer interface like this one that you can use with essentially a video game to help manage attention. And now these are being used and uh, FDA cleared to treat children with attention deficit disorder. Prescribing a video game, FDA cleared and reimbursed. So with all these new digital tools, wearables, devices, solutions, it's a bit overwhelming. So I've recently launched an early stage of a site called digital.health, that's the domain where you can uh, find a database of existing digital solutions, maybe find the right device you might prescribe to, a, to a, your, your patient, whether it's a, an Alive Core device to track their atrial fibrillation or an app to help them with their smoking or medication adherence. So uh, check out Digital Health if you wanna learn a bit more about what's coming and maybe start to prescribe apps, devices, and services to your patients. My last example is one of my favorites, is 3D printing. 3D printing is accelerated to the point where you can print a hip implant or hearing aid or your braces. I've been thinking about 3D printing in the setting of medication and polypharmacy. What if instead of taking a pile of pills, uh, you can essentially use your AI machine learning to pick the right drugs and right doses and combinations and build a, a personalized polypill. It might be a polypill for prevention or it might be a polypill for therapy. Um, and I call these IntelliMeds, essentially 3D printing a medication, let's say with a patient's aspirin, statin, beta block, or synthroid, th with the ability to maybe print that at the corner pharmacy with the right doses and combinations, uh, and eventually uh, uh, at home to optimize the medication dosing each day uh, when it's needed, changing a Lasix dose or uh, Coumadin dose as an example. Um, finally, I'll end with discovery. We're all uh, we've all been through medical training. We all want to accelerate discovery. It still takes often too many years with too many drugs and therapies failing. We're now entering this era of reinventing clinical trials to the point where they're becoming digitized. Uh, you can send the patient uh, the medications and a wearable device and track that at home and democratize these clinical trials. In fact, Stanford was a pioneer in that with the My Heart Counts trial for screening and understanding patients with cardiovascular disease. I think it enrolled more patients in Framingham in the first week than Framingham involved in, in, in many decades. So with these new potentials across healthcare, across clinical trials, we can really start to crowdsource the future of medicine. Just think about 
how different it is how we, how we drive. You know, we used to drive with, with paper maps, remember those? Now you can imagine getting around with that Google Maps or Waze. Think about if we could all collaborate and share information and build a Google Maps or Waze for our own patients and their healthcare journeys and to learn from every belt anybody else has been down that same road. To think of ourselves not as just organ donors and blood donors, but as data donors and really build that sort of Waze for healthcare. And in fact, I recently met one of the co-founders of Waze who's now built a Waze for healthcare. It's called Stuff That Works, where patients are crowdsourcing and sharing what's happening for their chronic diseases, learning from others, incredible data sets being built. And I think part of our future of medicine will be continually updated maps, information, insights that you'll get back as a patient or as a clinician to use in real time going forward. Okay. So in conclusion, I've covered a lot. I want you all to start thinking about not any one technology, but how they start to interface and converge. That's where the sweet spot is for solving many of our grand challenges in healthcare. To not think about where we are just in here, 2021. I mean, 2021 used to be the distant future, but to think about like Wayne Gretzky, where the puck is gonna be, where can technology and health and medicine be in 2025, 2030? And I think the sort of Stanford mindset, the collaborative mindset, all the new potentials around us really give us opportunity to really shift from our you know, intermittent reactive sick care model to one that's much more continuous, proactive, personalized, learning, participatory going forward. So I urge you not to think incrementally, uh, to start taking not linear steps, but exponential ones. In many cases, the, the future's already here. It's in my pockets, it's in some of your pockets in clinics. The future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And it's our opportunity, particularly those of us lucky to be part of the Stanford community, not to just predict the future, but to go forth and boldly create it together. So with that, thank you for your time and attention and uh, really honored and appreciative to be part of the amazing Stanford alumni world. Thanks.